Well, welcome back to our monthly Q&A. Here we go again. We tried to do this live, which was very popular, but hell, with the time difference around the planet and every, we've got viewers all over the world, it gets really complicated to try and get people to wake up at two in the morning. And hell, I'm not getting up at two in the... Well, having said that, we were up at two in the morning yesterday because we were moving bees, but that's another story in itself. Here we go. So I thought we'd start with Joe from Melbourne. Joe from Melbourne writes in and says, Hi Mark, I've made some swarm boxes last spring out of styrofoam that I had laying around. Just as an experiment, I placed them out in the yard and would you believe it or not, a quarter swarm. That's always good. I hope you had some bait frames in there or something. We decided to leave them in there as they were designed to be six full frames. So I'm guessing that makes them a nice sized nuke box. All was well till I noticed that the entry hole was slowly growing from around three centimetres and increased to about 10 centimetres. On inspection, they were removing it, but I don't know where they were taking it. Any ideas or comments? I can have a fair idea where the foam was going because if you've ever had a close look at styrofoam, it's pretty much like little balls. You play it around. And I remember when the kids were little then you get some packing from somewhere and had styrofoam packing and they'd get it and play with it. And there'd be shit across the lounge room everywhere. And you're like, oh my Lord. So what's happening, the ladies are going there and they're actually getting one little piece of it and of course it'll fall off and then they go, ah, this is a bloody untidy business and the ladies do not like their hive to be untidy. So they would pick it up in their little teeth or I guess they're called mandibles if you really want to get excited or something. If you know exactly what a bee's mouth's teeth are called, you can send us a questionnaire and hell, you can answer your own question. Anyway, they're picking up the foam ball and they'd be flying far away from their home and dropping it somewhere. And of course, they're not they're not kind of as limited as an ant where they can only cart it a little bit from their home. They got wings, so they can fly the shit a fair way away, so you'll never find them. I have an interesting little story about a mate of mine. He actually made some styrofoam boxes for his newt boxes, and they were out of broccoli boxes. And he was showing me, and I thought, that was actually pretty bloody cool. I did had a little broccoli box, and he made some bits of wood for the frames to hang on, which was really groovy. And I thought, well, shit, that's pretty cool. And then he made this really cool little landing board that he basically just shoved in the side of the box and drilled a little hole. Well, I think he used a Stanley knife and cut a little square hole and this little landing board shoved in the foam and the bees could come and land. And I looked at that and I thought, well, that's pretty bloody clever. I mean, a broccoli box from the supermarket's worth nothing because they don't know what to do with them. So he had all these broccoli boxes, made all these beautiful little newt boxes and had the little nukes in there, and he did the same thing as you did. Joe, he'd caught some swarms and caught some, put some other things in there, and yeah, and, and they were looking fabulous. But then when he went to pick them up about, I don't know, a month or so after they were in there, he goes down to pick them up, and as they were sort of like, you know, together, I guess, so they're in a row, they'd, they'd actually bloody burrowed out the side of the hive because they got so full they had nowhere to go, so they dug a great hole out the side of the hive and they started building bloody honeycomb and brood comb all outside in a big circle. So I don't think they were successful either. How exactly you would make it unpenetrable, I don't know. I guess you could line it with some burning board or some shit. That would probably stop them. But ultimately, they're just fiddling around in there and they just keep playing with the wall and then they'll get a little ball that'll come off and they'll go, stuff it, hell, this isn't good. And they'll take it out and clean it up. And so I, that's why when you see those paradise boxes, they're made of like super hard foams that they can't. So they've, I think they've heated that shit up and compressed it so it doesn't actually flake off like the other styrofoam. The picture I think you sent me, it looks a little bit like you were using the inside of cool room paneling sort of stuff, which is the same sort of stuff as the broccoli boxes. So I'm guessing that's why beekeepers don't use styrofoam broccoli boxes to make bee boxes. Hope that answers your question. Young Andrew's writing in, this is an interesting question, and I ask myself the question all the time. Andrew's asking, as an armour grower, did you decide to get into bees because you could see the writing on the wall regarding the upcoming shortage of bees required to pollinate existing orchards? Most definitely, young Andrew, that was definitely my motivation. And by having your own hives, you could guarantee some pollination of your farms and orchards and not be relying on, other, on the bee brokers or other beekeepers. Yes, well... That was definitely my initial thought. I thought I'd go out. I, I don't need a hell of a lot of bees. So I thought, well, I could probably manage a couple hundred hives and, you know, juggle my life and get organised. And so I went and bought some scrub. If you go back and you watch the really early episodes, I bought a little bit of scrub here in the Mallee 
And I thought that'd be cool. I'd cook my bees there. There's always something flowering in the valley. They might not make a lot of honey, but hell, hopefully they'll be all right. So I, put, I think I had 50 hives down there at the start or so, roughly around that. And I thought, well, I'll just build up and learn a few things. Hell, I thought I'll just make a YouTube channel and share my adventure with the whole jolly world and all. Just, you know, what the hell? <laughs> just for fun. Anyway, that's why when we're still here, that's what, three years ago. Anyway, sorry, I digress. So I got the Mallee property, I got some bees, and I thought, well, I could just put them there and then I'll go back and pick them up and they can put them on the armoured block and it'll be all good and I'll go on with my life. The interesting thing that happens is that bees are actually livestock. So if you've ever had any livestock, like if you've had, even if you had a pen of chickens and you don't go in there and throw the grain in, you're in sorts of trouble. So I soon found out that the bees are not something that you can not look after or not attend to. And also it stopped bloody raining, so that didn't help. So then we had to start moving them. And so then I was moving, oh well, hell, I had a trailer, which was kind of crazy, but it broke down and fell apart, which you can see that on another episode somewhere. And we decided that we had to be mobile beekeepers. And so we were moving our 50 hives around and I started thinking, well, hell, if you're moving 50 hives, it takes you all bloody night. Why don't you get a truck and move 100? And then I thought, well, okay, that's fine. So I got 100 hives and a truck. And then I thought, well, shit, if you've got 100 hives and a truck, then you have to bloody justify this crap. And so now I've got bloody, I don't know, 200, 300 hives more than I need for my almond growing. And I've got a truck and a loader and bee extraction and honey plants and, and a YouTube channel that everybody watches and, I don't know, I'm rambling and I've probably lost the question, but yes, I started off to be pollinating my almond trees, but bees are so much more fun. They're not as very profitable as almond growing, but hell, they're much more interesting and I love them. And so that might've been my reason for starting, but it sure as hell not my reason for hanging around. And if you've got a big almond orchard and you're quibbling with your beekeeper, well, shut the hell up because he's not charging you as much as he should. Okay, so we have Chris from the USA. Welcome all our USA visitors. No, you're not visitors, you're viewers. So anyway, welcome all our USA viewers. Hope all is well over there in spring. Whew, we're just going into winter, you're just heading into summer. Hell, I'm not sure. I'm pretty sure you think we're upside down, but maybe you're upside down and we're pretending we're on top of the world. But I think if you look at the world map, we're probably on the bottom. But, you know, hell, let's not quibble. Chris says, we love your show and are thinking of looking into a backyard hive of our own. Do you have any resources or recommendations for finding information about beekeeping in the US? I imagine things can be pretty regional when it comes to basically every aspect of the practice. Well, actually, there's some very basic things in beekeeping that are universal. So you can watch our show and hopefully we'll educate you a little bit. The main thing you're going to learn as far as regional stuff goes is your pollen sources and your nectar sources, because we've got different trees, we've all got eucalypts and whatever was going on here in Australia. In America, you've got some cool stuff. I think I read somewhere that you can put them on maple trees if you've got a maple tree orchard, but I think that's more Canada. Anyway, it's more about your floral sources and your seasons of moving. But if you're, if you're gonna have it in your backyard, you're probably not gonna stick it on a trailer and move it anywhere. So you really, ultimately, you wanna know about wintering. And I think in America, you've got everywhere from what is it, California, that's kind of like a bit like us and doesn't have a crazy ass freezing cold winter. And then you go all the way up to, isn't it, Idaho, where it snows its ass off and you got to get a blooming shovel to get out your front door. I think that's Idaho. Anyway, forgive me, people in the USA. You can send me an email and tell me which part of the country's warm and which parts are cold. I know there's some warm bits and some freezing cold bits. Anyway, recommendations for American beekeeping shows. There's two that come to mind. There's the Canadian Beekeepers blog. It's, he does a blog about his, his beekeeping and he's really very informative and really good about, and he's got this, one thing that I think is absolutely fascinating, he's got this bloody barn where he puts the bees in in the wintertime because it's that damn cold. So he puts them in a barn that he actually has to warm up because it's minus 17 and he only wants them at minus eight. Mate, I'm already cold when it's bloody 10. So anyway, I think that's pretty cool. And then my mate, the fat bee man, he's, he's good fun. Go on there and check him out. <laughs> and we have another question about the almond growing beekeeping cross section. Another Andrew or the same Andrew, I'm not sure. He wants to know which takes up more time, beekeeping or almond growing? Well, that's probably an interesting question. I think beekeeping takes up more time. The other day I was out at the farm and my poor dear mother says, you do realize, you know, you still have to actually come here and run these almond trees. I'm a little old to be doing it now that I'm bloody 85. 
And I'm thinking, I actually do come here and do some work. You're just never out of bed or actually home because she's always out gallivanting, playing cards or bowls or, I don't know, whatever she's doing, which is bloody awesome and good on her because I reckon if I'm half as healthy as she is at 84, I'm kind of doing all right. So what takes more time then? Oh, you actually want me to answer the question? <laughs> ah, the cameraman actually wants me to answer the question. I think beekeeping takes more time and makes less money. I think actually, to be absolutely honest, it would, I think beekeeping in my situation takes more time only because they're a living, breathing creature and I can't not go there and look after them when they have, a, hell, if the flowers stop flowering and they got to get moved, they got to get moved. Whereas the almond orchard, if the trees don't actually get pruned that day, they're not going to, well, they're not going to die on me for one thing. So as long as I've got that water and the fertilizer on the almond orchard worked out, but I could split myself 50-50, but at the minute it's probably 60-40. So, you know what? I reckon the way I'm going, I've got two full-time jobs. I could spend my whole time at the armor block or my whole time beekeeping. Now, this question might be a little bit out of my depth, young Hayden, because Hayden's written in and he says, can you please explain the process of using pallets for a base for four hives? And a little bit, it's cool that he's put it in little brackets that says, if you can. I'm looking into setting up a large apiary and I would like to know the process of process you use to set up for your pallets. Well, my pallet setting up program was a bit of a failure because I was going to use my crane and my crane's not strong enough. And I thought, well, I'm not going to break the crane because that's ridiculous. But I've seen plenty of other commercial size apiaries, apiaries, commercial size operators. And they're coolest things that I've seen when they're making their pallets. There's several different versions you can make. One large operation that I know, he had plenty of hardwood available to him. So he made up basically four cross members. So they would go two that way, two that, four that way. And he'd set the bee box on top of there. And then he had little iron rods at either end. So that when we used the strap, he would hold them down that way, which I thought looked very effective. The one thing I have noticed though, is you're having a frame of four, you want all the entrances facing the same way. So, so as when you're placing them in a shitty bit of weather, you're going to get the weather on their back or you're going to face the fronts, fronts to the sun. So don't make them with the entrances facing out four different directions or you get a hell of a mess. So that's what I've noticed. And other ones I've seen that are really cool are like a metal pallet that they've welded up out of some one inch square and they've put some little angle irons in the corner so they can't slip. So they have four little corners of that and they sit the boxes on there and they can't slip and then they just strap it down with another hive lock. Or what's another option that I've seen? They're probably the two most used for like the commercial boys, pallets of four. So anyway, when you make your pallets or whatever you're going to use, don't forget to send me a picture in hell. If John's feeling really charitable and you've done a kick-ass job, we might even click it up on the Facebook show. Well, either Andrew is a very popular name or he's on his third question. So, you know, kudos to you, Andrew. You've been divided up here into sections or I'm not really sure what happened. But here we go, your questions are interesting, so you're gonna get three bites of the cherry, or if you're all different Andrews, because we've got no last name, so you'll have three different questions, but waste not, what not, when it comes to a good question. It says here, he's asking, I think it's the same Andrews, because he's on the same sort of vein here. What is your long-term goal for the Bush Bee Company, i.e. is there a hive count you'd like to get to, or are you just wanting to get as big as possible? Well, now, growing as big as possible. Now, that's an interesting bloody dilemma right there. I would like to get, well, how, how big as possible because it really gets down to how many places you've got to put them to get them fed. So, so personally, I've set myself a bit of a task. I want to be at around about 400, 400 500 hives because I think as a couple, we can kind of run that many and look after them effectively and find enough sites for them to be at. And then I hope to sort of rear a few bees to sell to some other young beekeepers that want to get into the industry or, you know, bigger beekeepers that have had a bit of a bad year and want to keep their stocks bolstered. So I'm thinking about 400 hives would about do me, 500 sort of top end when it's a good year. And I'm sure when the honey's flowing and shit's going and it's all really good, I'd be wishing I had 10,000 hives. But when it's a crap year and you've got no honey and no neck to flow, you're really hoping you haven't got any more than three. So there you go. <laughs> And as far as the goal for the Bush Bee Company, I think the sky's the limit for that. But I don't know, maybe I've left them run a bit late. Only time I think about it, I think about poor old Colonel Sanders. I reckon, well, he ran the same chicken shop for until he was about 60-something. And then he kicked a, kicked a few goals over the finish line. 
So hell, maybe I'm in with a charge yet. You never know. I might make a go of it. Well, thank you all for viewing our annual Q&A show. Monthly. Thank you all for viewing our not-so-annual Q&A show because it's actually monthly. <laughs> As I said earlier, it's great fun doing it live and we probably will do some live ones if we can figure out the time differences. So we haven't totally ruled that idea out. But anyway, this seems to work. You seem to like it. Keep your questions coming. And if you happen to feel so led as that you want to write in your emails, don't forget to go to the Bush Bee Company email address. I think it's down here somewhere in the links. I have no idea. There's some links down here somewhere in internet land. Just, you know, go down there somewhere. What? I don't know. It's just downstairs. Or well, it might be upstairs. I don't know. No, I think it's downstairs. I'm pretty sure. I don't know. I don't do the internet real well. I mean, hell. I'm kind of YouTube famous, but a little bit, a little bit internet electric. Hell, if you feel so inclined to become a Patreon supporter, you'll get a priority and you'll get your email definitely get answered. And if you're already a Patreon supporter and you have a question, it doesn't even need to be B related. It could be, you know, I don't know. It could be related, related to what sort of socks should I wear when it's winter? Who knows? I'll answer a lot of crazy ass questions. <laughs>